Okay, today is day 34 on the schedule, and we have two different little lessons here to cover. Uh, the first one here, part one, is going to be about different kinds of maps that you may not be familiar with. And then part two, we're going to start the uh, discussion on topographic maps. And that will just be an introduction, and we'll finish that part up um, tomorrow. But remember that a map is a flat representation of the Earth's curved surface. Earth is a round sphere, of course, and when we draw a map on a flat sheet of paper, we end up having some difficulties drawing things accurately, especially at the North and South Poles. Um, the distances and the shapes of continents uh, get to be really skewed when we try to draw the extreme north and south of a ball on a flat sheet of paper. Now, normally we have the maps being these rectangle things here, but the northern part of the map and the southern part is going to get all whacked out. You can notice that on the um, bottom part with Antarctica, Antarctica stretches from one side all the way to the other, which makes it look like it's bigger than the United States, when in actuality Antarctica is, um, is a lot smaller than what it appears there. So anyway, how do we end up fixing this. And one of the ways is to draw the Earth not as a rectangle, but in sections like this. Or even more pronounced, here we have lots of pointy triangular sections. Other maps are more unusual. Here we have um, Antarctica, and here's the North Pole. And then everything else is drawn in relation to that but these are definitely in unusual patterns. And then here we have, again, the Antarctica and North Pole are drawn accurately, but then we have lines of longitude that are kind of curving. Lines of latitude are curving as well. Now, all of these different shapes of maps are due to the fact that the Earth, once again, is a round sphere, and we're trying to draw the surface of this round three-dimensional object on a flat two-dimensional piece of paper. And going from the three dimensions to the two dimensions brings up lots of problems. We're trying to draw the surface of the Earth like, the, like unpeeling the uh, skin of an orange and laying the orange skin flat like a piece of paper. But when we try to do that in real life, we end up with uh, a torn up mess. So how do we do this? Well, one way is to carefully cut the orange peel, the surface of the earth, so to speak, in these pointy sections like this, and then unpeeling it. That's where we get this kind of a map. It's called a Mercator uh, projection. And we end up with these pointy sections, just like we had the pointy sections of the orange peel. This way, the shapes of the continents are accurate, and the distances are accurate. But the problem is that we have all these gaps in between the pointy sections. And people generally don't like that. And so we end up with just the rectangular maps that we're used to. When you do those rectangular maps, especially with the entire world, you have to remember that the shapes of the continents are not exactly drawn correctly. And the distances are a little bit more difficult to figure out accurately as well. Okay, that's the end of the first part of the discussion today. Let's go on to part two. We're going to look at topographic maps. Topographical maps, these are the ones that have squiggly lines all over them. These lines connect places with the exact same elevation or altitude. Knowing these lines, these help us to understand where hills and valleys and flat land is located. These lines are called contour lines, and we will learn exactly how to read the altitudes of contour lines tomorrow. Right now, we're just going to talk about the other features of topographical maps. These topographical maps are used for lots of things, especially for governmental work, but also for um, individual persons. The government uses them for geological studies. 
to see how water is going to flow in one place or the other. Land usage decisions. For instance, when you um, are planning out a railroad track, you want to have it as flat as possible. You want to have everything as close to the same elevation as you can. And so using the contour lines, you'll be able to tell which locations have the same altitude. Other uses of city planning and agricultural usage as well. But individuals, people are using these topographical maps more and more, not only for old-fashioned hiking, canoeing, skiing, and all that, but with a newfangled um, hobby called geocaching. This is especially getting to be more popular now that people have cell phones with GPS units on them. But geocaching is a hobby where you go out and you use the locations of latitude and longitude to try to find hidden treasure, so to speak. They're not really treasures, but um, people will go out and hide small items and they will challenge you to go out and try to find them. And you use the lines of latitude and longitude to do that. Each topographical map is going to have certain features around the sides. And when different companies make these topographical maps, they might place them in slightly different locations. But we're going to be looking at maps made by the USGS. Um, that's the official map making organization of the US government. They put the name of the, of the area being mapped in the top northeast corner of the map. That would be the top right corner. The date that it's made is in the bottom southeast corner. That's the bottom south, um, bottom right hand corner. And the general name of the location, like Lake County or Fox Lake area, that kind of general location, uh, will be shown by a black square in the outline of the state at the bottom of the margin. The areas that a topographical map um, illustrate are generally pretty small, like the size of a county or even smaller. And sometimes it's hard to exactly figure out where it's illustrating. And so that's why they have the outline of the state and a little tiny black dot showing the location in the state that the map is illustrating. So here's an example of the bottom of one of the USGS maps. And if I can zoom in here a little bit, Right here we have a picture of Oregon and a little tiny dot way up there. That's showing what region of Oregon State is being illustrated by this map. And then off the side here we have the name of the area, Astoria, Oregon, and the date, 1949, updated in 1984. And then we have this thing right here. This is showing where True North is and where Magnetic North is and the angle in between. Let's talk about this here a little bit. Let me first rearrange the camera to be exactly as good as it can get. Okay, that looks pretty good. The compass direction at the bottom there has two arrows. One is going to be the True North, otherwise known as Geographic North. That's pointing to the top of the Earth's axis, that imaginary line that the Earth is revolving around. If you are standing exactly on top of the Earth's axis at this true, true north or geographic north, that's like sitting in the middle of a merry-go-round. You're not actually moving around in a circle there. You're just standing in one point, pivoting around and around. That's like standing right here on this blue dot. But then there's another kind of a North Pole, and that's the magnetic North Pole. When the compass points north, it's not actually pointing to this blue dot. It's rather pointing to this place in northern Canada where the red star is. The Earth's north magnetic pole is in that location, and it's not always in northern Canada. Sometimes it has drifted off into the ocean up here. And in fact, it's moving further and further this way as time goes on. 
a long time ago it used to be farther south in Canada. It's kind of been wandering around over the centuries. If you were down here in Iowa or Texas, the compass would be pointing straight towards the red star, which is also in the same direction as the blue dot. And so standing here, you wouldn't know that there was a difference between magnetic North Pole and the geographic North Pole. However, if you were over here in Alaska, the compass in your hand would actually point towards the red star straight east. The direction to the North Pole would be a very different angle up here. And so if you were trying to navigate yourself around the wilderness in Alaska, you would have to know exactly what this angle in between the magnetic north and geographic north is. If you didn't know what that angle was, you would get very lost very, very quickly. The exact location of this magnetic north has changed over time, as I've mentioned before. As best as we can tell, in the 1600s, it was way over here, off the coast of, of Canada. And then it wandered down here to 1700s, took a little jump to 1800, didn't go very far over the next 100 years. But then, from 1900 to 2000, it really moved a lot. And in just the last 10 years, it's moved almost just as much. It has really picked up steam. It's now moving towards Siberia. Okay, latitude and longitude. We've talked about this before, so this should be review for you folks. Remember that latitude, that is how far north and south a location is. And we get degrees and minutes to describe the exact location. The degrees are found in the bottom right-hand corner of the map, and the minutes are labeled along the right-hand side. And for the most part, we're just going to be looking at the northern hemisphere for our topographical maps. For lines of longitude, we get the degrees from the bottom right-hand corner again, and then minutes along the bottom of the map. And again, we're just going to be looking at the western hemisphere. So let's look at this topographical map. Um, pretty bare bones, but it's, let's start off with simple stuff. We want to find the location of the letter A there on the map. We want both the latitude and the longitude. So, looking along this side here, this will be the measure of how far north and south it is. And notice at the bottom it says 40 degrees, 15 minutes. And the next line, it just simply says 20 minutes. We have to assume that it's the same 40 degrees. So this will be 40 degrees, 20 minutes. The next line up is 40 degrees, 25 minutes. And then at the very top, it says 40 degrees, 30 minutes. Well, this letter A here is a little bit more than halfway up between the 25 and the 30. So pick a number between 25 and 30, a little bit more than halfway, and I'm going to say 28 minutes. So. The latitude here is going to be 40 degrees, 28 minutes north. Then we're looking at the longitude, going back and forth east and west. Okay, all of these are going to be in the western hemisphere, where we're at. And at the bottom right-hand corner here, it says 117 degrees, 45 minutes. And then it just simply says 50 degrees as the next dot. So we assume that it's the same 117 degrees, but then 50 minutes. And then we have 55 minutes. So that would be 117 degrees, 55 minutes west. And then the next degree mark, which is 119, 118. Well, this letter A here is a little bit more than the 55. So I'm going to guess 57 minutes. So the longitude is 117 degrees, 57 minutes west. The latitude is 40 degrees, 28 minutes north. 
go ahead and you try to figure out what the latitude and longitude of location B is. Please pause the video while you work that out. The correct answer for longitude is 117 degrees, 55 minutes west. We get that by looking at the B and going either up or down. Let's go down here. It's close to the 55, and that's between 117 degrees and 118 degrees. So it's 117 degrees, 55 minutes. Latitude, it lines up with the 25 minute mark here. And even though this just simply says 25 degrees, we look down here to see what, I'm sorry, this says 25 minutes. You look down here to see what the degrees is. So it's 40 degrees, 25 minutes. Okay, pause the video and you figure out what location C is. The answer is the longitude 117 degrees 50 minutes, latitude 40 degrees 20 minutes. Okay, all standard USGS maps have the same color scheme. Red is for major roads and highways like Highway 12, Highway 59, that kind of a thing, state roads. Roads that are um, alternating red and white are secondary highways like Grand Avenue, Monteville Road, that kind of a thing. It's red, white, and then it'll be red, white, red, white, red, white, over and over. Black is for buildings, side roads, artificial features. Green is for vegetation, areas of forest preserve and that kind of stuff, or farm fields. Blue is for rivers, streams, and other water areas. Brown is for contour lines and index contour lines. These are the squiggly lines that I talked about before that show you the areas of same altitude. And then purple here is revised map features that are added after the map was originally produced. So go ahead and pause the video, get some colored pencils, and please color in your boxes here in the same order. We have red, red, white, black, green, blue, brown, and purple. Okay, once again, a primary highway like Route 12 is going to be the red line solid. A secondary highway, a smaller road like a county road like Grand Avenue, it's going to be alternating red and white. A trail like those in Grant Forest Preserve will be a dotted line. Railroad tracks are going to be uh, horizontal lines with crisscrosses. Other symbols on a topographical map will include black squares for buildings downtown. They won't always have this shape here with six sides, but the general black um, squares, rectangles will be buildings. Schools will have a triangular pennant flag on top. Churches will be rectangles with a cross on top. And cemeteries will be boxes with either a cross or a CEM in it. And that's the end of this lecture notes. Please ask your teacher for the handout to fill up the rest of the day.